I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Better than you, oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you And I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you You turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes to shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can Oh, you're the only one who can And there's nothing than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing Nothing is better than you There's nothing better than you, Lord There's nothing, nothing is better than you
Hi everyone, um, before we start, just want to give a, a quick shout out to the Timbrels for getting me this epic t-shirt as a, a late birthday present. Nice. Um, we're going to look at one word today, uh, so it won't take long. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Uh, and that word is... No. We're going to look at the word no. And now that can seem a bit of a weird one to look at, um, particularly in the, uh, the culture surrounding church, because uh, as far as we're concerned, we need to be people who say yes. Uh, we say yes to so many things and so many people, and we think that, that God is a God of yes, and that, uh, that we need to be a people of yes. And yet sometimes, hopefully, as we'll be seeing through this talk, that sometimes we need to say no. Uh, there's things and there's people and there's situations and there's uh, there's choices in life that we need to say no to. Now before any of that though really I want to start by reading this weird old story that's told towards the beginning of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's in Genesis chapter 32 if you've got your Bibles or your phones with you. Genesis 32 starting in verse 22. Genesis 32, 22. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. And then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him, and he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Leading up to this story, uh, the bigger story that Jacob's life is all about, really, is a story of struggle. It was a struggle just to survive. Uh, reaching and grasping is literally what his name means. This grasping and this reaching out and this striving and trying to attain over and over again. This was a struggle for his identity. His sense of belonging, of, of who he was and, and where he fit in the world. It was a struggle for his family. This clinging and this grasping. Even going across into tricking and deceiving and lying and manipulating. To get his family blessing and to get his birthright. It was a struggle to survive. Wrestling to even find his own name. And here's Jacob. In this story, in, in chapter 32, we find Jacob alone. He has no possessions, no family. They've all been sent across to the other side of the river. Jacob's alone. It's night time. And he's wondering, who am I? Why am I here? Who is the Jacob beneath the Jacob? Is all he is and all that he'll ever be just a trick? Just a lie, just a deception, just a cheat. This grasping and struggling and reaching out isn't just even about his name. This turns into a spiritual struggle as well. He wrestles with God. Even though in the story that we've just read or heard, it says that he was wrestling a man. After the fact, Jacob says, I saw God face to face. So the question is, which is it? Was it a man? Or was it God? And the answer is yes. And somewhere else, 
Um, in the Bible, it calls this mystery wrestler an angel. So this isn't just a struggle to survive because we all do that. This is what it is to be human. It's part of the, the human condition is that part of life is that it is a struggle. But this struggle with Jacob goes further, as I said, into this spiritual struggle, a sacred struggle. What's my real name? Is what Jacob wants to get at. Who am I beneath this? And who are you, God? And it's there that God meets Jacob. And it's there that God starts to push back against the pushing that Jacob's doing. There's this pushing and this pulling that's taking place. This struggling and this wrestling. And it's in this moment that Jacob receives two things from God. He gets a wound and he gets a blessing. What's important for us to remember is that these two can't be separated. We can't go, oh, I don't like the sound of the wound, so I'll just take the blessing, thanks God. No. He is wounded and now forever he's going to walk with a limp. That constant, physical, maybe even painful reminder of this moment, of this event. But also he's blessed. And now forever, he'll be known as the man who wrestled with God. He has this new name. No more is he going to be the, the trickster, the cheat, the liar. Now he's the man who wrestled, who saw God face to face, who wrestled with God. Notice what's said here during this wrestling match. The man, or God, or the angel said, let me go, for it is almost daybreak, and we've been wrestling all night. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob's answer to this man, to, this, to, to God, to this angel, Jacob's answer is no. Just imagine God saying to you, let me go, and you saying no. Is that how you're supposed to talk to God? And then the moment that he says no to God, he gets this wound and this blessing. He receives this double-sided gift. And is that right? Can you say no to God? Well, anytime we want to understand God better, anytime we want to get a better view of, of who God is and what God's about, the place we need to look is Jesus. Jesus is that representation of God. So we turn now into the Gospels, into Matthew chapter 21. Just to hear a short parable from Jesus. Matthew 21, starting in verse 28. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But then he didn't go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. And Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. Even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. What a weird little story, that, that original, that, that beginning parable that Jesus tells in that story. But what an interesting dilemma to kind of uses a kind of thought experiment as well. Jesus loves to mix things up, doesn't he? As he tells these stories, as he uses these parables in his teaching, it's all about changing people's perspectives and getting you to assume something about someone and then him kind of pulling the rug from under us and making us go, what? What's going on? So one says no, but then feels bad and does it anyway. And then the other brother says yes, but then doesn't. So 
Who is this for? When Jesus tells this story, it's always, whenever you read any of the parables of Jesus, it's always important to read around them, to, to discover who it is that Jesus' audience is here, what, why he's telling the stories that he's telling. So who is this for? Jesus is talking in this instance to religious people. People who see themselves as morally acceptable, as clean, as the right kind of people. But then within the midst of that, Jesus mentions two other groups of people, doesn't he? Two very different people, tax collectors and prostitutes. These types of people are people who say no. With their lives, they're saying no to religion and no to the rules and no to traditions and no to God. But apparently now Jesus says that they are changing their minds. That's what repentance means. And not just that, but they, the, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, are actually what? Ahead of these pious, religious, good people. So Jesus says that there are all these types of people who seem wrong and have said no to God. But then they're actually the ones that are going and doing and being and then there were this group of people who with every ounce of their kind of external lives are saying yes to God but then they're actually failing they're falling short they don't turn up and to all of this Jesus asks that original audience and he asks us today what do you think I'll tell you that starts before he even says the parable what do you think Do you agree with this statement or not? Is this true or not? And if it is true, what does it mean for how we talk about faith? See, how much energy do we we spend trying to get people to say yes? Trying desperately to get people to sign up and to believe in certain things? See, Jesus is telling these types of stories and asking these types of questions to push out against the edges of what we assume about how things just are. It's just the way they are. And Jesus in his way is wrestling with those assumptions. This is about belief. What does belief actually cost you? That's the question that Jesus is getting at there. So you say, I believe the Bible. Or, I believe in the literal six days of creation. Or, I believe that an actual whale swallowed an actual man named Jonah. Okay, but what does believing that cost you? Nothing really. When Jesus was asked about what the most important commandment was, out of all of the others, he didn't say anything about belief. He could have. That could have been his answer. He could have given this very religious, moralistic, keeping all the laws, believing set things kind of answer. He could have given that answer, but he didn't. What did he say? He said, love. Love God and love your neighbour. Okay, so can you believe that then instead? If, If it's not about believing those things, well, can you believe that? Well, yeah, kind of. You could say... I believe in loving God, or I believe in loving my neighbour, but then just as equally you could say, I believe in loving my neighbour, and then not actually do it. But to really love, you have to do it. The act of loving will cost you something. There is always a cost when it comes to love. That's what Jesus is getting here. He's saying, don't just believe things. Don't just talk about things. Don't just tick things off some kind of spiritual to-do list. And in saying yes, in this kind of saying yes, but not doing it, and then or saying no and changing your mind and actually doing it parable, it looks like Jesus is telling us that saying no has a definite place in the kingdom. In a world where this belief was all about saying yes, apparently Jesus has come to tell us that saying no has a place in the spiritual journey too. 
one more reading place in your Bibles, getting you busy today. Um, Old Testament prophet Jonah. Uh, we referenced him slightly already. Um, good old Jonah. So uh, we'll just kind of float around in the book of Jonah just for a, a, the few moments that we've got left. So Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Straight away, how many of us would like this would like this to happen to us? Not necessarily this message, um, but a clear and obvious and direct kind of instruction or guidance from God. So God says, here's exactly what God wants you to do. Exactly where God wants you to go and exactly who God wants you to be. It's clear cut, it's black and white, it's definitive. This is it. So many of us would crave this kind of certainty. And yet in this story we read here, verse 3, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. So even though Jonah at the beginning here is given this certainty, is given this clear cut, obvious, direct message from God. The moment that Jonah gets this message this guidance from God, which is what? Preach against Nineveh because God has seen their wickedness or their wickedness has come up before God. And remember, Jonah is a prophet. This is what he's supposed to be doing. It's his job. But in that moment of clarity, he says no. And he runs away as fast as he can and as far as he can in the opposite direction. And again, it gets you to question there, even within three verses, gets you saying, really? Is this how we're supposed to respond to God? Is that our relationship with God? Is this even how we're supposed to read this story of Jonah? That it starts with a serious mistake made by the prophet. And then this story, we all know it, moves on very quickly and dramatically through the sleeping in the boat and the hiding and then the storms and the lying about who he is and where he's come from and the tricking and then eventually owning up and being thrown into the sea and of course being swallowed whole by a whale. And then it's in that massive fish, it's inside the belly of that whale that Jonah has his own kind of dark night of the soul in which it turns into this big epic prayer just like in Jacob's story that we read at the beginning there's this real sense of Jonah wrestling with God and these questions come up again and again who am I why am I here and eventually after this prayer Jonah gets um, spit up out of the the whale and onto a beach and where is that beach? Nineveh. And so he does eventually go to the city. And that thing that at first he said no to and ran away from, now he's doing. And we pick the story back up in, in chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. And so Jonah, the prophet, delivers this prophetic message to the city of Nineveh and his warning worked. They repent. And not only that, but that works, the repentance works because God forgives them. The God of the Jews shows mercy and forgiveness even to the enemy of God's own people. 
And the story could end right there, couldn't it? But it doesn't. The story isn't quite over. Chapter 4, verse 1. But to Jonah this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Jonah's angry. Why? Well, because to him it seemed very wrong. He's angry because God forgives Jonah's enemies. He says to God, if you keep reading, he says, I knew you would do this, God. See, at the heart of it, Jonah is angry because God is able to forgive more than Jonah is able to forgive. And then we get to what seems to be the whole point of this weird little story. See, the point isn't that Jonah gets swallowed by a whale. Here's the point, verse 5. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. So God asks Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah replies, yes. Yes, it is. He's indignant, isn't he, at the fact? Even to the point of wishing he was dead. Very dramatic. Is it right to be angry with God? And then it finishes like this. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Should I not have concern over the great city of Nineveh? in which there were more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. And then notice what happens in as we get through to the next chapter, into chapter 5. Oh, wait a minute. There is no chapter 5. That's how this story ends. God ends this story with a question. Maybe that's how this God works. You see, Jacob wrestles with God. And what does God do? God wrestles right back. Jonah's angry at God and Jonah asks a question of God. And what does God do? God asks a question right back. The same goes for Abraham and for Job and for David and on and on and on. And maybe for you too. If you question God, maybe God has a question for you. So what's the moral here? What's, what's the lesson? What's the takeaway that we can get from this? What do we do with these kinds of stories? When we're thinking about this word, no. What do we do? Well, I've just got three thoughts to, to kind of leave you with surrounding the stories of Jacob wrestling with God. And the parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 21 and with Jonah's story. Firstly, it's okay to doubt. Now, it might sound a bit weird coming from a pastor, but it is okay to doubt. Doubt God. Doubt that there is a God. Doubt what you've heard other people tell you about God. Doubt your own calling. See, doubt isn't unbelief. See, if you're asking these kinds of questions, if you're raging at God, it means that you believe that there is a God who is willing to be questioned and raged, raged at in the first place. I've got a quote from Thomas Merton. He puts it brilliantly. He says this, The best way to pray is to stop and let prayer pray within you. Whether you know it or not, this means a deep awareness of your inner identity. It implies a life of faith, but also a life of doubt. You can't have faith without doubt. 
Doubt and faith aren't opposites. Doubt and faith are two sides of the same coin. Doubt and faith are dance partners. But somewhere along the way, we've got kind of got it muddled and mixed up and we've started to believe that doubt is bad. We demonise doubt. We've made it a kind of taboo subject. You just don't talk about it. Even if you do have kind of doubts, you don't bring them up. But that's not what the Bible says. It's not what Jesus says. So that's the first one. It's okay to doubt. Second takeaway is this. Go ahead and run. And again, this might sound like a weird thing for me to say, but run for your life. Run away. Say no. See, if Jonah hadn't said no in the first place, and if he hadn't run away, he'd have never have been involved in this 120,000 people revival in Nineveh. If something in you is saying, say no, then do it. If there's something in you that's saying, run away, then do it. Because religions and religious institutes and organisations have gotten really, really good over the years at saying, don't run, don't say no, don't leave, don't question, don't doubt. But if you want to say no, say no. If you want to doubt, doubt. Jesus even says it himself, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Maybe that's what you need to end up closer to God in the long run. And it might be painful. It might be difficult. It might hurt. You might end up like Jacob with a limp. You might end up in the belly of a whale. But that's the second point. Go ahead and run. So it's okay to doubt. Go ahead and run. And then my third and final one is this. No is just as important as yes. As an author I love called Frederick Buchner in one of his books he wrote this. It's, it's a bit of a long quote but please stick with it because it, it says it all. He says this. You tell me Christian commitment is the kind of thing that has happened to you once and for all. Like some kind of spiritual plastic surgery. I say go to. Go to. You're either pulling the wool over your own eyes or you're trying to pull it over mine. Every morning you should wake up in your bed and ask yourself, can I believe it all again today? No, better still, don't ask until you have read the New York Times. Until after you've studied that record of the world's brokenness and corruption. And then ask yourself if you can believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ again for that particular day. If your answer is always yes, then you probably don't know what, you, what believing means. At least five times out of ten, the answer should be no. Because the no is as important as the yes. Maybe more so. The no is what proves that you are human, in case you should ever doubt it. And then if some morning the answer happens to really be yes, it should be a yes that is choked with confession and tears and great laughter. Laughter at the human condition, at our own absurdities, at our own questions and struggles and our own wrestling. Oh, what a quote. See, without the questions and without the doubts and without the times of saying no, I wouldn't be here now, talking into this iPhone, speaking these words into YouTube land. No one who has anything to say or anything to teach of meaning to us about God and about ourselves and about this world that we find ourselves in. Nobody has never had to wrestle with God or run away or say no. I'm not saying that I'm done with all of that now. I'm not saying that it's something that you, you travel through and kind of transcend into a greater plane of existence. No. There will still be times when I and you struggle and when we doubt and when we wrestle and when we say no and when we run away. Because it's all seasonal. This life is a journey. So today, what's your no? What's that thing that you say... I just don't know if I get this anymore. 
Or, I don't know why that family member is sick and they're not getting better. Or, I don't know why I lost my job. Or, I don't know why that relationship is falling apart around me. Bring your no here. Bring your no to God. Because God's big enough. God can take it. God can handle it. God wants you to be honest. God wants you to wrestle. God wants your no. Amen.